Welcome to the narrated step-by-step -step tutorial for my painting, Blue Hen Falls. The photograph on the right is the reference for my painting. This is a photograph of a small waterfall in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park called Blue Hen Falls. This photograph was taken on a cool, damp fall day. And even though there's an abundance of gold and yellow leaves laying around and sparsely populating the trees, their colors are muted due to the condition of the day and the low light. You'll see as my painting progresses, I reached a point where I decided I wanted to brighten up the composition and key in more on the fall colors that weren't as evident in the photograph itself. So my interpretation of the scene is going to be a little bit brighter so I can pick up a little bit more of the spirit of fall in my composition. I begin by doing a light pencil sketch using a B pencil. I've drawn the major shapes and some level of detail, but not a lot. Before I begin painting, I've decided that I'm going to mask some of the highlighted areas in my composition. This is something I think about very early on in my process. I think about the layers that I'm going to be building up. And one of these layers uh, involves the, the white of the paper. There's areas where I want to have uh, some highlights and I want to have the pure white of the paper showing through. And if it's in a situation such as in a landscape like this, where I'm going to be doing some large washes, uh, the most efficient way for me to preserve the white of the paper is to use something such as this masking fluid pen. There are times when I just use direct painting and I paint around those shapes, but in something like this where you're, you have a lot of fine marks that you're trying to preserve, it's just more efficient, I feel, for me to create this effect by using the masking fluid. I've put the masking fluid on the waterfall itself and now I'm uh, moving into the area that is where the water is flowing and I'm going to mask off some highlights to give the suggestion of the current in the, the flow of the water and uh, I think too often people overlook uh, the impact you can have by the direction of your marks, whether it be with your paintbrush or whether it be with this masking fluid pen. You can use these uh, elements in your composition to help suggest direction. So in this area, this area that I'm working right now, as I'm using this masking fluid pen, the marks I'm making have some direction to them and in the end they're going to help suggest the current of the water in my composition. The same will be true with some of the brush marks I make in this area. Here I'm using masking fluid to uh, preserve some of the highlights on the rocks and the, they're defining an edge of this slope which, which also has direction just as the, the, some of the other marks I made. So this, the direction of this highlight will help lead the eye down towards that waterfall. I'm going to begin my painting by applying a large wash. This is a mixture of cobalt blue and Halloween orange. You could also use Windsor orange or Azo orange or any other orange you might have. Just adding a little orange to the cobalt blue helps drive it more towards neutral and just graze it down a little bit. And I'm using a uh, silver black velvet jumbo round small wash brush. It really loads nicely. You can see the nice bead of water that it puts down there and helps uh, make it easier to put down a nice even wash. And as I put this wash on, you can see I'm painting right over top of these tree shapes. And if you look at the photograph, you can see those shapes are very dark valued. So as I move through my painting and start to add some of these other elements, I'll be going right over top of this wash and it won't impact the results that I'm getting. Now, if I were uh, trying to put a strong indication of the direction of light and highlighting the edges of these trees, I wouldn't be taking this approach. I would uh, either be masking the highlights 
or I'd be painting in between the trees and saving the white shapes themselves. I can go either way, but in this particular composition, those are going to be dark valued shapes. I'm taking that same wash down into the waterfall and into the flow of the river. And uh, the same is true here. This large shape that I'm painting, that's the, the body of water. Later on, I'll be putting some uh, darker values in here with some of the, to indicate the flow of the water. And I'll be painting over top of this wash. And because it's a, a darker value, it's not going to matter that I've painted this whole shape like this. There's no reason for me to try and paint in between um, marks that I'm going to be making and suggest the flow of the river. The other layer that I have here that's not as evident right now is uh, I have the areas that I've masked. So uh, in essence, I have two, area, two uh, layers developed. I have the areas that I protected with the masking fluid, which will be the white of the paper, and I have the areas that I've applied this wash to. And as I go further in my painting process, I'll be building layers on top of these. I'm going to continue applying a light valued wash using the same two colors, cobalt blue and Halloween orange. I've added a little bit more orange to this mixture, however, to drive it more towards neutral. So what I've ended up with is more of a cool gray. So it's towards neutral, but it's still on the cool side. And now I'm coming in with, again, the same mixture. However, I've increased the amount of orange in this mixture. So the ratio has been changed, leaning more towards the warm side. So I still have a neutral, but it's more uh, of a warm neutral. So same two colors, but you can see the, the different results depending on uh, the ratio of the two colors that I have in my mixture. If you look at the photograph, you'll see on the horizon there's a line of orange trees. So I'm going to give a suggestion of those trees using a wash of burnt sienna. And I'm going to come in with a mixture of quinacrid and gold and quinacrid and coral to brighten things up a little bit. And before I uh, started to apply this, I uh, came in with clear water and I uh, wet the paper in the areas where I wanted this tree line to be. So I didn't put water on those white shapes, but I did put it right above the horizon line there. So that's where the paint is going to stay. But I got some soft edges because I was painting wet into wet. And now I'm coming in, still painting wet into wet. And this is my mixture of quinacrid and gold and quinacrid and coral. You can see it's much brighter than the burnt sienna tone by itself. So I still have my wash brush. And at, at that, uh, that area of the tree line, it's still wet and wet because the paper, I wet the paper to begin with and um, and then I began to apply pigment. So now the area that I'm uh, putting my uh, tone down now is wet on dry. So I'm carrying that uh, a little brighter tone down more into the middle ground area there of the rocks and uh, the trees and, and getting uh, given the indication of the ground cover here. So this is still a mixture of quinacrid and coral and uh, quinacrid and gold, but I have more quinacrid and co coral in the mixture than I did uh, with the first one that I had put down there in the trees and on the, on the start of the rocks. And here you can see where I've come back again and softened the edges with a spray bottle. I like to do that. And I'm trying as I make some of these brush strokes to keep direction in mind and I uh, want this to give the indication of uh, that slope that's on the, the, the uh, ground there. And so as I, I make some of these brush strokes, I try and keep that in mind just to help uh, give a stronger suggestion of direction in, in the composition. I want a little texture in this area, so I'm going to shake some coarse salt in the, the wet 
uh, pigment and that'll just help create some texture uh, throughout the the areas where it's uh, the paint is wet and you can see where it's going to start to create some texture and then once that salt comes off it, it'll uh, leave a, a textured mark there that won't be as dark as what it appears right now I've decided to scrape some lighter tree shapes into the painting and so I'm using a plastic scraping tool and the best time to do this is when your paint is at the point where it still has a sheen but it's not so saturated the paint flows back in after you've, you've scraped it and it's not so dry that it prevents you from moving the paint because when you're doing this you're moving the paint you're not damaging the paper you're not scraping away paper you're you're moving the paint so as I've shown in some of my other videos the best time to do this is when there's a sheen and uh, so I'm scraping some here in the background I'm also going to scrape some of these uh, tree shapes that I've drawn here more towards the middle ground and uh, give an indication of them with a lighter tone that I've scraped away and I may keep some of that light tone I may just paint over it but I have the opportunity right now to do that and uh, it just adds some interest in the composition Now I'm coming in with a cool mixture that is uh, made up of royal blue and burnt sienna. You could do this with ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. That's kind of a classic combination. Um, but it makes this uh, dark value neutral. So I'm going to use the spray bottle to soften the edge a little and let that run down some. going to continue here on the other side of this waterfall with this darker value this uh, unearthly tone so when I'm doing this type of brushwork I'm using just a, a general purpose uh, small to medium brush in this case it's a sable brush it's um, an Escoda sable brush and it's a for me it's a good uh, general purpose brush to use for a lot of different applications here I've moved on to a mixture that has more burnt sienna uh, in the, the mixture and I've added a, a touch of quinacridone and coral to make it a little stronger than just the burnt sienna Here I'm going to continue on with my brushwork using the same two colors, the royal blue and the burnt sienna. And you can see how varied the, the actual color that you get is by changing the ratio in your mixture. So I can, I can take those two paints and I can make a very cool gray or I can go the other way and make it a, a very warm burnt sienna tone. I'm going to continue on using this mixture here in the area that represents the flowing river and this is kind of in an area that's cast in shadow by the rocky uh, shoreline and I'm using my water bottle to soften the edges but it just gives this uh, cool neutral tone uh, in the river and uh, it's still pretty much middle value but um, the one thing to keep in mind is that this is an area where I've applied some masking fluid here to to preserve some of the highlights and that they're, they're they've been applied with some direction in mind to give the suggestion of the flow of the water so that won't be revealed until I, re, I dry my paper and I remove that masking fluid when I reach that point you'll see the the uh, pure white of the paper in the areas where I had protected it by the by using the masking fluid. Here I'm using a mixture uh, of the uh, royal blue and burnt sienna 
but I've added a little sap green to it. So it's changing the, the, the mixture that I'm using here just a bit. And I'm going to use that combination of the uh, royal blue, burnt sienna, and sap green to bring that greenish tone into the painting. So still dealing with neutrals here, very muddy colors. Uh, but little by little as I continue through my painting process, as I vary some of these ratios, the other thing I'm doing is starting to go darker with my values. I'm taking some of that dark metal value tone and I'm applying it in the area of the waterfall. And that'll help make some of the areas that I've masked stand out once I've removed the masking fluid. Here I'm doing brushwork with a much darker value, still the same mixture, royal blue and burnt sienna. And I'm starting to be a little bit more deliberate with my brush marks. I'm working wet on dry and I'm uh, just trying to give more definition to these rock shapes that are on the rocky shoreline in this subject matter. While I'm painting harder edges here, I still uh, touch it a little bit with a fine mist spray to soften it and let that bleed a little bit. I just like the effect it gives and it fits the subject matter here where I've got this kind of cold, damp, misty day. I'm going to hit that again to soften the edge. And little by little, I'm starting to build my values. Uh, it's a pretty dark value there that I've applied. And I'm going to do some of this brush work uh, across the whole composition here as I start to bring in more definition to my subject. So now I'm going to come in and paint some of these dark tree shapes. And I'm putting almost clear water there and I'm going to come in with a dark value in that water and it's just going to help it flow down that tree with a little bit of interest. Um, if you remember at the start of my painting I, how I put a large blue wash down I painted over these tree shapes and I wasn't concerned because I'd be coming in with a darker value and this is where I do that and you can see why uh, it, it didn't really matter that I was putting a large blue wash down I, and I wasn't painting in between the tree shapes uh, that I was going to paint later because it's such a light value, it, it had no impact on uh, the, the results that I get on my painting. And that's just uh, some of the thinking ahead that you have to do when you're working with watercolor is plan your process a little. And the more you do it, it'll just become part of what you do. It'll become a routine for you. I'm gonna start painting some of these other tree shapes. And as I do this, You'll, you'll notice this is a dark value, but while it's uh, very dark, I'm using both a warm and a cool mixture. It's hard to pick up maybe the subtlety of that on the camera, but uh, there's some of these that are leaning, some of the, the brush marks I'm making have a mixture that's leaning more towards the cool side, and some of them are leaning more towards the warm side, but they're both the same value, so um, it's not as obvious. I want this uh, orange tone that I have in my painting to be stronger and bolder. So I'm taking a mixture of the quinacrid and gold and quinacrid and coral, and I'm working that into my painting in some of these areas where I already had some of this tone. And uh, you can see that it's a, a much richer, stronger mixture that I'm using. I've applied this tone here on the left side and I'm softening it with the fine mist spray and I'm letting that paint run down my page. It gives a, a nice gradation of that tone throughout the composition when you start to work in that, that nice gradation and diffusion of color over top of other areas. Uh, 
I'm taking some of that rich mixture and I'm placing it here on the uh, oh, where the ground cover is at to give the suggestion of that ground cover and I'm going to come in with uh, my fine mist spray and I'm going to soften those edges up a little bit and let some of that color diffuse out over top of some of the other areas. I'm going to continue with some of this brush work on the right side and I've added some alizarin crimson to my mixture which it makes it a little bit more of a purple tone and I have some uh, brush marks that I'm making that have a little bit of sap green added to some of these mixtures. Here I soften the edge a little bit and let that, that uh, paint run. Now I've taken a mixture that has uh, burnt sienna with a little bit of royal blue but but leaning more towards the burnt sienna and I've added some uh, sap green so I have this kind of dark middle value earthy green tone and uh, now I'm doing some brush work that gives a suggestion of the water flowing if you look at the photograph you can see those ripples in the water so that's what I'm trying to suggest with my brush work and early on in my composition is when I laid that uh, the, the blue tone and now that will be working side by side with the uh, brush marks I'm making to give a suggestion of the water flowing and picking up the blue of the sky and the the muddiness of the of the uh, riverbed and and what's going on around the shoreline so this again is another element of the planning that I was referring to I knew that I was going to have some of these blue shapes and have some of these earthy green shapes to give the suggestion of that water and I handled the the uh, part that's blue by putting a one large wash on early on in my painting process and now I'm coming back with this uh, earthy green tone and I'm painting over top of that wash to help uh, strengthen the suggestion of this water flowing. One of the elements of design is size and uh, this is a good example when you look at the brush marks that I've used to define the flow of the water these in the foreground are much larger than those in the distance that I made using uh, the masking fluid early on so this is a, a good example where I'm using the size of my brush marks to help establish the difference between the foreground middle ground and background it gives some validity to uh, the composition I'm going to take a rigger brush with some darker values and I'm start, uh, starting to give the indication of the, some of these other tree shapes that are here in my composition. When you're going to be making a, a lot of uh, linear shapes such as in uh, this composition here where I'm giving a suggestion of trees, one of the things you want to do is have a variety uh, of uh, shape you, you don't want these all to be the same length. You don't want them all to be the same width or go the, all the same direction. You don't want the spacing to be the same. You want to want to vary that. You want to make some trees close, some farther apart, some short, some long, some at a bit of an angle. Uh, you want to have variety and you want to make sure that you don't end up with tangents. So you wouldn't want the end of say a branch to stop right at the edge of another tree trunk. It, you'd want it you'd want it to continue if it's going to intersect it, you want it to continue through and come out the other side so you can see what's going on there but you, that's something you need to keep in mind when you're uh, doing something like this and you can see also how I break these up I don't just draw straight lines I, I have broken lines uh, across the, the linear marks that I'm making I'm going to continue on here uh, with a darker value 
and some of these trees drop below the horizon line and, and some of them are right on the horizon line so you know they're on the other side of the hill here and uh, I want to strengthen the edge on these some of these trees that are more in the middle ground here so I'm taking a darker value here with my rigger and I'm uh, putting down a brush stroke with a darker value and a harder edge to further define those tree shapes that are in the middle ground. Now I've completely dried my paper with a hairdryer and I'm using a pickup eraser to lift off the masking fluid that I put down at the start of my painting process. And you can start to see these uh, very white, bright highlights uh, start to be revealed as I remove this. Now I'm at a point in my process where I've switched to a quill brush that I like to use for more detail work. I've got a very dark valued mixture of royal blue and burnt sienna. And this is a process that I follow. I like to start with bigger brushes, larger shapes, lighter values, softer edges, less detail, and then I work towards smaller brushes, smaller shapes, uh, darker values, more detail. And so this is a process that I follow often with with my paintings as I move through my painting process and I'm at the point here where I'll move around my composition and I'll I'll put some dark values in areas where I think it strengthens an edge or draws interest helps create contrast in an area that I want to draw the viewer into and and this is where I'm getting towards the end of my painting process when I do this and it really is a point too or sometimes I start to build a uh, uh, stronger depth into my painting because of the, the use of these values. And as I do this and I start to build some of these stronger values, I'm keeping them in the middle ground um, and that helps uh, enhance the feeling of depth in the painting because if you have too much of the same value everywhere it gets confusing to the eye but when you can differentiate foreground, middle ground, and background by the, the values used, uh, it, it helps validate uh, what you're trying to achieve in your composition. I could have had this darker value play a larger role in the uh, foreground or the background rather than the middle ground, but for this particular composition I chose to have the uh, uh, main activity with these darker values more in the middle ground. Here I'm at a point where I'm, I'm putting some finishing touches on the painting with some of these darker values and you can see again the concentration of those dark valued brush marks that I've put in are focused more in the middle ground of my composition and less in the foreground, less in the background. And there you have my painting, Blue Hand Falls. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. I'm going to put a white mat around it so you can get a good look at it. Be sure to check out Rick Stewart's Watercolor Friends and Subscribers on Facebook. And if you have questions about my materials, you can always go to the studio page on my website, rstewartsart.com. And if you have specific questions, you can always email me at contactrstewartsart.com at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.